Now, before I bring David on, let me give him a proper introduction, okay? So David Knox is an icon in the real estate training world with 40 years of experience as a national training director, CRS instructor, and highly respected international speaker. He has been a top presenter at 30 NAR conventions and has presented at more than 3,500 seminars in all 50 states and 12 countries. He is the producer of the popular client video, Pricing Your Home to Sell, that agents have used in their pre-listing packages for years to get listings priced closer to market value. He hosts an online video training system called www.realestatetrainingbydavidknox.com. David Knox is also an international recognized real estate speaker and trainer. He is known for delivering common sense, practical methods in a very entertaining way, leaving audiences with solid techniques and the inspiration to use them. His specialty topics include real estate pricing techniques, negotiation skills, and overcoming the toughest objections. For the last 32 years, David has been the president of David Knox Productions Incorporated, creating seminars, online training videos, and consumer videos. Please join me in welcoming David Knox to the show. David, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you very much, Adam. Very good to see you. Thanks, yes. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. You know, it goes back uh, many years. I, we used to, when I had my own brokerage, we had you as our trainer and we popped in your training. And I tell you what, the practical approach to real estate that you deliver is top notch. It's easy to implement, but it's, it's still relevant today and you keep cranking out good material. So thank you for coming on. Well, Seriously. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So before we get into like anything, I always like to just do a little bit of rapid fire questions just so the audience can know who you are and get to know you a little bit before we get into the actual conversation. You okay with that? Absolutely. All right. So are you a, are you a reader? Oh, gosh, yes. All right. I figured as much. I'm, I'm a big avid reader, love reading. So right now, what kind of books are you currently reading? Um, I went back to uh, Think and Grow Rich. You know, you don't want to go back to the 30s. So I went and uh, took myself through that. Uh, Fanatical Prospecting by Jeb Blunt was probably one of more, my more recent uh, business books. And um, and actually, by the time I get home, and got the hour before I go to sleep, I like to read spy novels. So oh, uh, anything by Tom Clancy, Nelson DeMille, one of my favorite all-time books, yet nothing to do with business at all, is uh, <clears throat> A Gentleman in Moscow by Amor Tolls. That's the only book I've ever read twice. Oh, that is awesome. That's kind of similar to kind of the way I do my my reading. My morning reading time tends to be business leadership, that that you know, industry yeah. specific. And then I try to do some kind of biography or novel in the, at night. So spy novels, that's pretty good. And what yeah. was the other what was the other book? The I, the Think and Grow Rich one we actually just did as a giveaway, I think last week. That's one of yeah. my absolute favorite books. Um, but what was the other one? Uh, the other is called Fanatical Prospecting by Jeb Blunt, spelled B L O U N T. And uh, about eighty percent of it applies to real estate. Twenty percent is more business to business. So, uh, but the other stuff is absolute. It, it gets into the importance of connecting with buyers and sellers. Oh, okay, I'll have to check that one out for sure. And the audience, be sure to check that one out. That's great. All right, here's here's another one for you. What was your first job? <laughs> first job, <laughs> uh, bag boy in a local grocery store. All and right, I got, I got fired from that because I tried to get too much stuff in a woman's bag. And then I was a gas station attendant. I got fired from that. Uh, you know, we talk about congratulations, you're fired. Thank God I got fired from some of these jobs. And uh, and when I talk to kids, they say, oh, these are crap jobs. And my answer to that is there is no crap job. No. You, know, every, you learn from all of them. And, and if nothing else, you'll learn you don't want to do those jobs. Uh, <laughs> That's you exactly not right. spend your life in a, in a, you know, a minimum per hour job. You want to get into a career and get out of that. Uh, you know, people talk about the minimum wage and, uh, I think the minimum wage is for people who are kids, not those who have kids. Uh, so I learned from that. But I learned customer service. And then when I uh, got into college, um, nobody was hiring anybody. So a friend of mine and I said, well, nobody's hiring. I'd rather be an employer than an employee. So let's start a business. So we started a company called Knox Reedy Painting Company. We painted houses, you know, the college painters. And uh, we did that every summer. We made quite a bit of dough. And we bid by the job. And uh and we said, okay, here's what the job's worth. There's four of us. We divide up four ways. And when it's done, you get paid. So the faster you get done, the faster you get paid. But if there's any mistakes, uh, you got to go back and fix them. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, that's that's the key, right? I mean, customer service, they're, oh, the customer's always right. So painting, that's good. Uh, yeah, that's a good college job too. Because again, yeah. it's it's kind of, you can pick the job you want to do and it's good money. Like you said, yeah. that's, that's 
wise, wise. All right. What's your hidden talent? Um, well, some of my past hobbies, I was a private pilot back in my 20s, scuba diver, um, race car, I guess race car driving. I got uh, my racing license uh, back in, let's see, early 80s. I raced against Paul Newman at Lime Rock for Whoa. a number of years. I raced it. In fact, if you do a Google search on Lime Rock Trans Am 1986, uh, I was in that race and I entered as an amateur. I had an overweight, underpowered car, but I didn't care. I just wanted to play in the game. And uh, they started me DFL, dead freaking last. <laughs> I got in at promoter's option and, uh, but I started the race and it was pretty cool. You know, the national anthem helmet on your hand TV and, and the race took off and I just loved it. Paul Newman came up on me and I thought Paul Newman ended up winning the race. He lapped me five times. So I know oh. I was on TV five times, but I thought, you know, I don't want to be the guy to take out Paul Newman on his home track. Yeah. And I, I often use that story to help agents understand that even if you don't win the listing, sale, prospect, whatever, that some of the greatest fun and challenges can be in the dumbest things you get involved in, the most ridiculous people that you've got to treat it as a game and, and just enjoy mm. it. I won my first race. I won my last race. And um, but the, the only one I ever talk about is I was in a pro race with Paul Newman. Yeah. And since then, I do track days. I mean, I've been into Porsches forever. I was an instructor for the Porsche Club for a number of years. And I bought a new uh, GT3 in October. I've had oh. on the racetrack 13 times. And um, so that's and then, wow. you know, what a, a rock and roll band. And then goodness. somebody taught me how to play guitar. So I did that as well. So kind of a varied I, list of interests. I would have never guessed those things, to be honest. Uh, really? But that is awesome. So you're, you're, almost, you're like a thrill seeker in a way. You, you yeah, like adventure. Addicted to vitamin A, adrenaline, absolutely. In fact, this morning on my way here, um, you know, it's just a two uh, two mile drive. But if I turn north on Highway 100, there's Highway 100 and Crosstown freeways where you get those loops. Oh yeah. And I just need my morning dose of vitamin A, and I just go through those corners, and uh, I hold it at 55 or 60, and I just keep going around doing laps. And go, oh, that was fun. And I get in the office, I'm ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> so most people might put music on, you know, like no. headphones, some jams. You're you're driving your car like a race car. <laughs> yeah, my my cars have radios, but I've never used them. I, I heard they have radio. I didn't even know how to work the things. Uh, <laughs> when you got a flat six, normally aspirated motor behind you, you want to listen to that. Oh, absolutely. You don't want to drown that noise out. Yeah, hear it purr. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, uh, more of a serious topic now. Uh, last rapid fire question though, but I, I love this one. Uh, what's one thing your mother or father taught you that completely changed your life? <laughs> I would say my father, the one of the best, he taught me how to double D clutch heel and toe downshift in a five speed dots and 16. And so he's the one who got me addicted to, to, uh, to driving like that. But I think the most important two things that come to mind, uh, one of them was uh, start saving your money. And I said, mm. yeah, but I'm not making enough to save. He says, you'll never make, make enough to save if you don't start saving. And he said, take whatever percentage of your income and put it away and hide it from yourself. And I remember saying something to him. This was a long time ago, of course. And I said, yeah, but I'm going to save all this money, but inflation is just going to make it worthless. <laughs> he goes, you're better off with a lot of money that's worthless than no money Yeah, that's worthless. And, uh, and as a result of listening to my very uh, conservative financial father when the market crashed in 2008, I was able to weather that storm. So I still pass that advice on to people. In fact, my Zoom yesterday with a bunch of realtors, um, I said, yeah, you're in a market, you're making hay while the sun's on, but you flat out better start saving money because the market's going to go the other way. Don't think, absolutely. you don't think this is going to last forever. Yeah. So start saving your money. And uh, my mother and father were very different in and my dad, you know, oh, I don't know if we can afford this. We got to save some money. And my mother was, oh, honestly, Charlie, let's take a cruise. <laughs> so I have a little bit of both into me. And my dad actually wrote a book on CAD CAM, computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturer. You talk about left lane engineering guy. So I have a little of the left brain in me. So that's why I love doing all our editing and technical kind of stuff. And then I have the right brain in me, like my mom, expressive, outgoing. And that got me into speaking and, and training. So when I oh, started wow. real estate, um, it took me a while to get good at it, but once I did, Ralph Burnham, my boss, uh, asked me to start doing the training of the agents. Well, that that, that actually goes straight in. Let's go right into the next question then, because that's that's a perfect segue for that. So walk us through that journey, right? Like that led you to where you are now. Like where did you begin and how did you end up being in David Knox Productions? Well, this uh, partner of mine, a guy named Dar Reedy, uh, he and I decided to get in the real estate business together. He came over and said he was going to get a licensed course. And I said, well, there's nothing on TV. I might as well join you. 
So I did. And for the first six months, I was with a company that, you know, was horrible. I couldn't sell mittens in a blizzard. I was still in my party mode from college. And it wasn't for quite some time that I finally cleaned up my act. And then uh, Adar and, and another guy named Ralph Burnett started a company called Burnett Gagner big company that ended up getting sold to, sold to Merrill Lynch in 82. And then they bought it back, made it Burnett Realty. And then they sold it to, uh, and then uh, they sold it, or Prudential got in the business and they bought it back from Prudential anyway. So, it, and then they sold it to Coldwell Banker. So it's a long history. Of, oh, wow. So when I started with the company, it was like eight or nine agents. And when I was doing training, it grew to about 2000 agents. And uh, so I was just happy to be, you know, the training director. And I wrote the four week training program. I got managers involved, which I think is critical. I got top agents involved and it became one of the leading training uh, or training in uh, U.S. I'm sorry, Minneapolis real estate area. Wow. And what, what year what year was that? Uh, I think it was 77, 78 when he made me training director. Wow. And then in 79, I became a CRS instructor. I decided I wanted to do more national speaking and I tried out to be a CRS instructor and I passed. I was in uh, Hawaii 1979 and I passed and I had taken a course by Lou Tice called Achieving Your Potential. To this day, some of the greatest self-image psychology training ever. And um, and I did just a very simple thing. Um, I found out where the audition room was the <laughs> day before and I went to it and I'm expecting this big hall. There was going to be lots of people watching me on stage. Well, you couldn't, there wasn't enough room to change your mind. It was a little tiny thing with a table with six people and, and a couple of chairs. I went, oh, am I ever glad I came here to see what this is like? I mean, this was talk a real intimate presentation. So I went back to my room and did visualization, which, you know, think and grow rich. And, oh, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. teaches that, that the power yes. of visualization. Every mm. professional does it. Race car mm -hmm. drivers, skiers, everybody does it. So I went back to my room that night and I visualized giving my presentation in this very confined environment. So when I walked in, I was comfortable. I, I knocked out the interview and I passed right away. But then <laughs> at my first CRS course uh, was in Albany, New York in February, and I sucked, bombed and died. And I, the worst presentation I'd ever done in my life. You know, back in Minnesota, you know, I'm a hero because I'm a local trainer. Well, they always like you at home. Well, now. Yeah. Go to a national New York audience. Forget about it. They pay <laughs> yeah. bucks to be there. And this young punk kid gets up there tripping over my microphone cord, uh, asking stupid involvement questions of the audience. Just horrible. And at the end, the rule of the CRS instructors was to sit down and critique. And oh. you go back to the senior instructor's room and you sit around. And with guys like Howard Brinton, Bill Barrett, Dave Beeson, uh, and Dell. Bain. Del Bain was like oh. the most intense. He's like the godfather of the CRS group. Yeah. And in the, when I was all done with my center, I said, so Del, how did I do? How did I do? And he goes, I took some notes. Oh, oh no. Wow, you took some. Oh, okay. Well, I must have really done. Well, he's got a whole legal pad full of notes. <laughs> and we get back to his room and, and he said to me, I uh, said, would you like some feedback on your session? Yeah. So how do you think I did? And he goes, let me ask you something. This is your first national speaking engagement. Is that right? And I went, uh-huh. He goes, it shows. Oh, oh he says, hurts. you know what? Well, let me let me just ask you, do you do you really want to do this? And I went, oh, yeah, I've set a goal. I've written affirmations. It's really one of the things I want to do. I've, with vision, I've envisioned this. <laughs> yeah. And he said, uh, I think you're in over your head. Oh, and I said, he said, if you want, I'll, I took some notes. I'll go through them with you if you want. And I went, well, sure. And he said, well, let's start off with, you know, what you did right. He says, you know, you got up there. Mm. You attempted. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? And he goes, not really. <laughs> and he said, did you notice the audience? And I went, audience? No. He says, they weren't with you. None of them. Oh. Did you realize half of them walked out on you? They were gone. They walked out. The rest were reading newspapers. One woman came up to me and asked for her money back. It's an all oh, true my. story. I mean, I'm not just saying I was bad. I'm saying I sucked. And <sighs> and the next day I stayed, I stayed up till one in the morning. I went back to my room. I was up in tears. And I went, you oh, I don't and I thought my first thought was, Screw him. They like me at home. I don't need to do this. And I thought, well, that's not a mature response. Um, so I worked through my material the next day. Next day, I was still bad, but I wasn't quite as bad. Yeah. And um, and that was a huge turning point for me. And then six months later, I had another CRS course in Tampa, Florida, and I opened up my assignment package. And my instructor is Del Bain. I said, Are you joking me? Seriously, <laughs> Del Bain is going to be my instructor again? So now I stayed up till, I don't know, one in the morning for 30 days in a row. And one of my topics was getting listings priced right. 
Okay. This was back with the Croy machine where you turn a dial and press a button to type out letters and you tape it on a piece of paper, you put it on a copier, you put it on clear acetate in a full, you know, oh, yeah. graphic. You know, we're going this is we're talking pre-Civil War technology now. And I wrote charts and graphs and diagrams on how to overcome objections. We can always come down. Can we just try it for a while? We need the money. And uh, I put this together and it was my turn to get up. And I know from Dell's comment. You know, did you notice the audience? I learned that you pay attention to the audience. That's why when I yeah. do Zoom calls, if they don't have their camera on, I don't even yeah. want you on the Zoom. If you're I not going to sit in the hard. front row, just leave. I don't. Why? Why are you not sitting in the front row? Just go away. I want to see people. I want to interact. But yeah, that's I was looking true. back at Dell, and Dell was back there, and he's a real intimidating looking guy. And he was sitting. His arms were folded like this. And he was bouncing his shoulder blades off the wall. <laughs> and I looked over <laughs> at him, and about. 20, 30 minutes into it, he went. Oh, okay, he looked, all right. He looked broke out crying and the thing. But all those charts and graphs became one of my strong suits and ultimately became this, pricing yes. your home to sell. So the fact that he had the courage to tell me that I suck and inspire me to get better led me down a career. Not only did I become senior instructor in all three courses, rather than getting fired, I created a video that pretty much put us on on the map and i still all those charts that i did back then still work today you know the stairs yeah. stuff you can always come down and every february yeah. 8th uh i would <clears throat> call del man and thank him Until you know a few years ago i called him and his wife answered and she said well i hate to tell you this but del's got dementia i don't know that he's going to recognize you and i said well put oh. him on anyway and uh and clearly he he was in a different place so I just said, Dell, I love you. And he, and he goes, David, I love you. You were one of the best. I always thought you'd make it. So he he got that out. He got that. And then, then a year later, he died. So mm. um, he will forever be one of my mentors. I love him. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm grateful that I've got people like Del Bain and Howard Britton, Dave Beeson, uh, Pat Zavi, yeah. Bill Bear, oh, so many people. Yeah. Uh, Mike Vance, you know, Mike Ferry, Daniel Kennedy, yeah. so yes. many people. Yes. Um, you know, so I consider friends, you know, Brian Babini, and we can go down the list of all the greats in the industry. Mm -hmm. And um, some people say, you know, they are competitors. I said, no, no, they're respected contributors to the industry. We're that's well we said. We all agree. And even when Mike Ferry and I get to, together for lunch, which we should do that again. Yeah. Uh, at the heart of our principles, we are 100% agreement. 100%. Yeah. yeah. A different style. He likes to. You know, he likes to challenge the audiences and sometimes I'll be kinder and gentler, but you know, we agree. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely true. And, and there's, there's market share for everybody. That's the thing. That's yeah. the beautiful thing about this industry, but I love the story because, and even to correlate this a little bit into even the real estate industry, it's when an agent first gets into the market, it, they're, they're nervous, they're worried, and they're going to have that opposition. They're going to have that adversity. Yeah. But one of the things you did is you just didn't let that define you. You, you put yourself right back out there. Um, failure is part of it. Um, it's okay if you don't have it all figured out, but the point is you showed up and you're okay with the accountability, even though the accountability was not the words he was giving you was not exactly what you wanted to hear. <laughs> you're okay with that. And that's well, probably you why to. you are where you are now. Well, thank you. Yeah. If, uh, you know, I, I got involved in, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous a back in, uh, Oh, gosh, late 70s, which, by the way, the reason everything else happened from 78 on is because I quit drinking, clean up my act, got involved in outpatient treatment in AA. And one of the things they say in AA, which I still like to quote, of that is if 20 people tell you you've got a tail, mm. just turn around and look. I mean, be open to feedback and it's going to hurt. The, the mm. feedback that is the most accurate is the stuff that hurts the most when it's from husbands, wives, children, you know, best friends mm. when they tell you stuff. And I still get that all the time. You know, I, I'm yeah. constantly. So I'm coming across stuff where I'll have a zoom and somebody says they didn't like this, that, or the other thing. I go, okay, what could I have done differently? Yeah. And, uh, learn, listen and for agents. Yeah. You got to take a breath, suck it up and, and decide, do you want it bad enough to work through it? Yeah. That's, that's well said. Let's, let's transition then a little bit into uh, the real estate market. Now let's talk about that. Let's talk about um, some practical methods um, of building a real estate business, you know, things that agents should be doing just every single day. What's some advice would you give an agent out there? New uh, experienced. I, before I do that, I want to wrap yeah. up. The, I think you and I talked about, you know, the worst speaking experience. Yes. I, I want to flip around on the other side and just kind of talk about that. I had a couple of best ones. Um, I'm always careful to, to not mention company names and things like gotcha. that. But in 1990, I was invited to speak at a huge convention. And um, 
And I thought, wow, this is an opportunity to speak to a company I haven't spoken to before. And they asked me to the key, be the keynote speaker. And I went into the room and you talk about the opposite of the of the interview room. It, you could park two 747s and it was the Orlando Whoa. World Marriott. And they had two of these big IMAG screens up there. And I'd never worked that big an audience before in my life. They had seating for 4,000 people. Oh. And when I came in, all the front row seats were filled with stuff. And I said, what's all this stuff on the front row? And they said, oh, they're saving their place. And I went, what a refreshing change. These agents that will rush to get a back row seating, which just, I can't stand that. Just leave yeah. the business. And then yeah. this group, they all rushed to the front row. I said, I don't know who mm. they are, but boy, I'm going to like this. And I was really nervous about this. And I thought, you know, I teach, treat it as a game. Let go of the outcome to create more income. So I went back to my room, put on Red Sox. And I remember when they introduced me, I did the moonwalk across the stage in Red Sox. And <laughs> they started cheering for that. And um, I did. In fact, my seminar was mastery of the game of selling. And at the end, I got a standing ovation from 4000 people. So it was fun to look wow. back at Del Bain telling me you probably shouldn't be a speaker to get a standing ovation from 4000 people. So there you go. Failure to success. Yeah. Well, and again, it was a long journey. It was 1979 with Del Bain and it was 1990 when I did that. So it, obviously it takes a while to to work one's way through. So, but it that's, was that's so true. And, and you, a lot of failure on the way. And that's <laughs> one thing that, I mean, I'm a product of many failures and I've still got a lot of failures to go. Um, and you know, you just got to embrace them and keep going, just keep going. Yeah. Um, be uncomfortable, be adventurous. I think you can relate to that yeah. with, with, with what you're interested in. So, so, so back to your question, uh, yeah. getting to some value in today's market. Uh, you know, what's different? What's the same? <clears throat> I, you know, obviously the technology changed everything. Uh, when I got in the business uh, early, they, the way you found out what was new in the market, you'd get these little paper sheets about this big and they deliver every morning with three, you had to three hole punch them, put it in a three ring binder by district and then go through <laughs> and find out what's available. And now it's instantaneous and faster. Yeah. In fact, the way the market's moving now, Johnny Carson once described the fastest measurement of time is the time between a New York stoplight turning green and the cab behind you honking. Well, now <laughs> shortest time is from the time the ink dries on a listing agreement to get the first offer. Oh, and yeah. it changed everything. Again, this is going to pass. But yeah. in the meantime, you've got to deal with it. Uh, but I think technology, like anything, it's always two-sided. If you watch the show on Netflix, uh, social, what's it called? Yeah, uh what is that called? I know exactly which one you're social talking dilemma, about. I think. Yeah, social dilemma. Yeah, social yeah. dilemma. We talk yes. about technology has has two sides. Nuclear mm. effect. I watched John Stewart <laughs> on, uh, the other night. And he said, you know, when they discovered splitting the atom, you know, they said, here, we could make electric power. Here, we could blow up the world. Ooh, let's try this. Let's try this one. <laughs> let's, let's just try this one. And it's, you know, genie's out of the bottle. Uh -huh. I think technology and real estate has the same two things. It, uh, mm. we, we know the benefits of it and the, how we can speed things up and make things easier. And obviously, uh, virtual connecting with Zoom, you know, those are all great. But the problem is it's become a, a customer barrier. Yeah. And people think that technology uh, can establish relationships. And I've said that technology is a great way to maintain a relationship, but a horrible way to start one. Mm. And ironically, the more technological we get, the more human relationships are important. Yeah. And agents don't answer their phone. You know, I talk about some major first impressions that agents are horrible. They don't answer the phone. Anytime I get an agent answering the phone, my first assumption is I got the wrong number. <laughs> oh, and, that's so and that, true, though. And they finally call me back with, I thought it was a spam call. Great. So you're going to piss <laughs> off your customers rather than you take the spam. Why don't you take the bullet? You take the spam call. Hang up on them. Do whatever you want. But why should your customers have to pay the price because you don't like spam calls? Answer the thing. Delete it. Clear out your voicemail. Yes. And they say, well, I'm really busy. Well, if you're busy, hopefully you're busy making money. Profit that's first. Right. And if you're making mm -hmm. money, hire somebody to answer the phone. Send it to your kids. Send it to your dog. <laughs> you know? But answer the phone. If, if It's axiomatic. If somebody dials your number, they do want a personal conversation. If they wanted to not have a conversation, they'll text, they'll email, they'll whatever. So answer the phone. I have a current photo. I take a look at agent mm. business cards, not so much lately because, but I'll see it online. I'll Zoom somebody. Then I'll look at their photo and go, and I've actually, this is a true story. <laughs> I've actually said, do I have the right person? I, I yeah. swear to God, I've gone in there and said, oh, oh, do I have the right person? Do I have the right company? Because there's photos. <laughs> couple of decades old. Oh and yeah, I've had scary. that experience. If you have a, a good photo and you know it's 20 years old, they look at you and the first thought is, oh my God, did anybody else get hurt? Um and emails, I get emails that no signature on them. It just signed mm. Bob. 
you know, none of that stuff. So these are some basic things that we should have fixed 20, 30, 40 years ago. Well, That's no, true. Email. I mean, technology, I, as far as like like email and voicemail and those type of things, they're aids. I mean, but they're, it's all about relationship. And, and you're right with the phone. If somebody has made a phone call to talk to you, that is very important because a lot of people don't do that anymore. If that person's calling you, that's a rare thing these days. You need to take that call because I guarantee you that's a buyer seller or at least they know yeah. somebody. Well, whatever. It, do, it doesn't matter. I mean, yeah. Answer the phone. And if they want to email, text, you know, communicate in the style that they choose and tell. But, but as Bob Wolf said, one of the top agents in, in the world literally says, David, I've never sold a listing. Uh, I've never gotten a sale. I've never done it by, the, by text or email. If I don't get them on the phone, probably not going to do business with them. So play with their little means and then... You know, if you got the text, you've got their phone number. And if you want to be respectful, yeah. say, I got a great property. I prefer to tell you about verbally. May I call? Or worst case scenario, just call. You just already call. don't have them as a prospect. How much worse is it going to get? And, um, but yeah, technology, it's the relationships that, that define. I had to get my carpet cleaned down in California a while ago. And I just went in online and called the first carpet cleaner. Thought, how long is it going to be before I finally get somebody? First guy I called to answer the phone. They said, is this a real person? Yes, this is me. How can I help you? And you know, I gave him a big tip. And it, it, so anyway, uh, well, build relationships with people. And uh, before we started, we were talking to Ann about past clients. And she is yeah. fortunately very, very good at connecting with past clients. How do you do it? Uh, you know, pick your way. So yeah, that's email, voicemail, yeah. telephone, event. Uh, you know, event marketing is a great way to connect with people. And um well, and, and I'll add this. Um, so if someone goes to your website and they get some of your training, which I, I say you need to do because it's practical. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to use the word script. I would say dialogue that you can use to engage. I think a lot of people are, a lot of agents are afraid to make the call because they just don't have, know what to say. They don't know how to say it. They don't know how to deliver it. Yep. And you give them practical steps on your videos and stuff on exactly that. And I, as far as we got, we got all this great technology. I don't disagree. You know, CRMs, everything is great. We got to have those nowadays. Absolutely. But there is something about the phone call. And that is a very valuable thing these days. And knowing what to say is key. I mean, knowing yep. what to say is key. And, and that's why your DVD is still relevant. Yep. And I don't like to teach people what to say. I like to teach them what to ask. Oh, there you go. So all my scripts and dialogues, most of them are just good questions to ask, open questions, you know, the two most powerful questions that you can be asking right now today and for the rest of your life in the business forever period, uh, tattoo them on your hand. I actually have a, our members, I have it where you can print them out and put them on your clear case on the back. Oh, yeah. the first most important question you can ask any other human being for the rest of your life is, how much longer do you plan to stay in your current home? How much longer do you plan mm -hmm. to live here? When are you planning on moving? Win, win, win. Not, do you plan to sell? In fact, I got a call wow, from that's guy. good. I got a call from a guy uh, a little while ago. It was a cold call. And I thought, he said, hi, Mr. Knox, do you own 304 Lock Bowman Road? Yes, I was just calling um, with such such real estate company. Uh, just calling to see if you're planning on selling. And I said, well, interesting, you should call. First of all, I'm in the real estate business. I do training. So I congratulate you on, you know, making a cold call. You're in the yeah. top of the planet Earth that you can do that. And I said, but do you, uh, you know, I do training. Do you want some advice? And he goes, well, sure. You ask me, do I plan to sell? It's a closed dead end question. I'm going to go, no, no. <laughs> and that's it. Conversation over. I said, you have to build an open question, time based. I said, here's a question. And if you want, you write this down word for word because nobody gets it. I've done this in seminars. I give it to them. They still screw it up every time. So write it down. And it's how, Mr. you know, you can go, Mr. David Knox, you still in the process. So, by the way, how much longer do you plan to stay at 304 Lock Moment? Uh, and I would have, I would have, I said to him, I probably give you a better answer. I would have said, well, I got a fiance visa in process. And if it goes through, we'll probably uh, stay in this home. If something works, doesn't work out, I'll probably gonna sell this, go someplace. I would have given you more of an answer. And he said, well, thanks very much. Well, then I got a handwritten note from the guy. Oh, wow. And, uh, and he said, uh, David, thank you for your words of wisdom on the phone on 93820. I actually had success off of today. Huh. So, you know, he did two things that, you know, 99% of realtors have, are scared to death to do. You know, one, he got on the phone, he called, made a cold call. And number two, he wrote a handwritten note. So uh, some of these fundamentals work. And uh, in a market like this, in fact, at this same location in Rancho Mirage, um, I'm on a golf course and a guy came by, got off his golf cart, walked over to my wall and said, you know, do you own this home? Yes. My wife and I are looking for a place along here. Just curious if you're planning on selling. 
And I smiled. And I said, well, uh, no, but no, I uh, appreciate you stopping by. I said, I'm going to use this in my next Zoom to realtors. And he said, well, then let me ask you this. My wife and I really like these south facing homes. Um, do you know anybody else who might consider moving? So he asked the second question, <clears throat> which is of all your friends, who do you think would be the next to move? And I said, there's a friend of mine down there renting. So if she's renting, it means they, they may want to sell. But, you know, you got to get off your golf cart and knock on doors. Agents yeah. today have to be as motivated to get listings as the buyers are. You know, they're getting out of the door, they're driving around, they're knocking on doors. And they say, oh, I don't like knocking on doors. Well, great. Great. How's that working for you? And I get there's gated communities and condos. I, yeah, I've heard all the excuses. Oh, you can find excuses. Excuses exist. Yeah, and, no and, doubt and about you, it. And by the way, I don't mean to mock that. Obviously, yeah. you don't violate do not call. You don't violate the do not solicit. And if, yeah. But if you're in a building where it's do not solicit, do not knock, my God, how about mail? You know, mail to them. Yeah. Um, talk to the owner of the building. Say, hey, could I sponsor a little event down in your lobby someday? Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're just going to do coffee, lemonade, whatever. And everybody comes through the lobby, you know, they get something. I don't know. You got to be thinking how to have a conversation with another human being. Well, and I totally agree. And, and this is also something we see when we go to national conventions and stuff. There's usually a brainstorming panel of top selling agents up there. Right. Yep. And, the, and it never fails. The guy, oh, the the um, MC will always ask them. He'll ask. So where like what is your number one prospecting that you do now? I will add these are these are not just, you know, a million dollar sellers. These are. 20, 30, 50, $100 million sellers up here on this right. panel, across the board, they all say they door knock. I mean, these people are well in the six figures of income and they're door knocking. Yeah. So, and it's every single year, every single year. It, two, you're right. Uh, it's Two top agents in uh, the Beverly Hills area, they've become kind of a famous team, <clears throat> Berman Candell. And uh, I've known him for years and years and years. And we were bringing up door knocking and people say, oh, gosh, in Beverly Hills, you would never door knock in Beverly Hills. They <laughs> door knock in Beverly Hills. Oh, now, I haven't talked to them later. Uh, oh, for, man. For being on the show. So anyway, these uh, these two agents will knock on doors. You know, can I borrow a cup of Shiva's Regal? You know, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and, and and by the way, this this the purpose of this isn't to convince people to just knock on doors. But I yeah. will say this. If you have a listing, you flat out better take that one listing better create two more by absolutely you know list justice card just sold cards knock on doors neighbors only open house and then you have a good excuse to knock on the doors hey i'm david knox i've got tom and susie's home in the market this is a courtesy call to see if you might have any questions on it. oh thanks very much yeah my husband and i were wondering what the asking price is and then you can have those conversations see um, how easy that is guys you see that that's simple i mean just the way he delivered that right there is all you got to do i mean that was easy that was awesome yeah and, that's, that, and as and a dialogue's easy. And I think everybody listening, oh, yeah, the dialogue easy, but where do you get the courage to do it? Well, that's a better question. Where do you get the courage to do it? And again, Bob Wolf, I think he's quoting some book that was written. He said, David, real estate agents today don't need 20 more techniques. What they need is 20 seconds of courage. 20 seconds of courage. Pick up Ooh. the phone and call. You drive by for sale Ooh. honor, your hands sweat, your heart, just get out of the car and knock on the door. Even if they don't answer the door, which you're probably hoping, at least you got out of your car. And that's where I talk about treating the business as a game. There's three results of human activity, reward, experience, and learning. Mm. Uh, one is the reward, the listing, the sale, the relationship. You love the book that you read, whatever. You know, you, it, you won the game. Uh, yeah. Number two is the experience. Like my race with Paul Newman. I didn't win. Heck, I was five laps down. But I will tell you, it was the most fun race ever because I went from dead last to 19th. I worked my way halfway through the pack. That was it's incredible. From 36th to 19th in an amateur overweight uh, car with professional drivers, that was better than winning against three oh, guys that don't want to drive. And then sometimes you go through experiences like divorce, business challenges, where there's no win, there's no joy in it. And then mm. it becomes the, the L, the learning, the lesson. And yeah. um, so my experience with Del Bain, you know, I, I died. Uh, I hated the experience but I learned a lot. So if you're going to lose something, great, but don't lose the lesson too. Yeah. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. Hold on to that. I, I'm a big fan of journaling your day. I'm not talking about long journaling, but at least capturing highlights like that, things yeah. that I need to learn and remember. Um, sure. And I encourage people to do that. So before we wrap up, uh, let's talk about uh, real estate training by davidknox.com. Uh, tell everybody exactly how to access that, how it's set up and what they can do to use that. Uh, it, it actually began years ago when the when the market crashed. I'd been doing uh, videos. Are you still there? By the way, I just saw myself yeah. on full screen. Good. Yeah, uh, you're on full screen. Yeah. Good. I um, 
I started doing video training years and years ago. It was on D VHS and then DVD. I did a series called The Mentor Series 2. And people loved it because I did role play demonstrations of all the skills of real estate. And when the market crashed, uh, brokers needed training, but they didn't have any money. So we said, obviously, that we need to go online. Bandwidth wasn't very good back then, but it was good enough. We put some low res four three aspect radio ratio videos on. We started with 70 videos. We now have about 700. And I've used the analogy that we are now like the Netflix of real estate training. Uh, there's a lot of great training courses out there that are little seven day hits, 10 day hits, you know, things like that, that are really, really good to go to. Our focus is the 24 seven, 365 online training available to all agents at all experience levels all the time. And uh, we've got, I don't know how many hundreds of companies signed up. And then, you know, we've got the mobile app called, where did it go here? Knox training. And then when, the, when our members tap on that, they can access, you know, what's new for June and all the different videos we have on listing, selling, pre-listing tips, low appraisals, overcoming objections, pricing, commission. And uh, I'm the presenter on many of them, but we have 80 faculty, 80 or 90 faculty, where we go out in the field and um, and either follow around in transactions or we interview them. And uh, it's pretty reasonable. It starts at 147 a month for a small office of 125 agents, and then it goes up from there. Uh, but it's, you know, it's like a subscription to cable TV, uh, about the same price. Uh, but there's no commercials. There's no politics. It's just good, solid training delivered in average length, uh, 12 minute videos. Uh, so if anybody out there is a broker owner and would like to have something for sales meeting and training sessions, uh, you can go to davidnox.com and, uh, there's a little click on training and go down and get a free trial. And oh, I'm that's happy awesome. to do a Zoom demo as well. But we, uh, in fact, we're releasing, what's the date today? In a couple of days, I'm going to release four segments of Real Estate Live number 43 featuring uh, an agent from Seattle, Genevieve Stoll, who talks about how she started it as a new agent in a new market, knowing not a single person. Oh, wow. And she goes through that because a lot of agents ask. And then the next three segments on how she works buyers through this insane market. So you talk about videos. This is absolutely current. I mean, yeah. we recorded her a couple of weeks ago and we're still very much in the market that she's going to be talking about. It's really good. Good, relevant conversation. Yeah, from content. real agents. It's, you yeah. know, it's, it's from, uh, she's doing Someone it. Someone in the field. Yeah. In the field doing it. And yeah. we want to feature that as much as we can. That that's awesome. Yeah, I, I like your comparison, Netflix for real estate agent, because that is that, I mean, that's absolutely that's what, it, what is. it is. That's the best yeah. analogy. Yeah, that's I mean, great. Have, I don't know, like a thousand downloadable documents, graphs, charts, checklists, all kinds of printable materials, Excel spreadsheets that people can use. Like one of our Excel spreadsheets is a multiple offer checklist. Yeah, we're all the way across the top are the offers and all the way down the list are the criteria of a contract. And you can type it in, fill it in, print it. And when you're presenting offers to the sellers before you go through this 27 page contract, you just say, let's do an overview. How do you like which two should we look at first? And in fact, so, I said you can use that with a buyer. How do you get a good offer out of a buyer? Oh, say, there you this go. is the multiple offer checklist that owners are going to look at. Here's all the criteria. How can we improve on every one of these price being obviously the dominant? And then after that. That is awesome. Yeah. Super easy to use it. Um, I've used it in the past. It's phenomenal. Um, it's got great content and handouts, like he was saying, like things you can use practical, 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 and relevant. Um, before you go, uh, David, uh, Stephen Robinson, he's the principal broker owner of Century 21 Advantage Realty in Kentucky. He's a Mr. Knox. Thank you for being on the show. I so appreciate you sharing your knowledge and insight with us today. Thank you very much, Stephen. Appreciate it. Well, David, thank you so much. You're always welcome back. If you ever want to come back on, just hit me up. I'd love right. to have you back anytime. Good deal. Uh, pleasure to see you, Adam, and every, uh, everybody else that's on. Uh, thanks for tuning in. All of you have a good weekend. And uh, my final comment, I want every one of you with a past client, I want you to call them up and pick one and say thank you for your business. Start with the first buyer or seller you ever had. Call them up and just say, just call me and say thank you for your business and see where mm -hmm. that conversation goes. Oh, that's great advice. Perfect advice. David, thank you. You're very welcome. And uh, I'll let you get on with the show. If, if I can do anything for you, you let me know. Absolutely will. Thank you, sir. All right. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Bye.